course, we don't have a quorum yet. Just send it out to everybody. Thank you. Father Sonia was in our attendees, so I've moved her over. Oh, well, thank you. There you are. Hey, thanks, Gary, for that quick action. It was oh, What was going on? Why it wouldn't didn't work for my iPad or my computer or anything. So it's a team effort. I said I mentioned it to Drenda, Drenda mentioned it to Christina, she sent the email, and here we are. What's this thing on Johnson? And here I am. That's really stressful. I actually tr try to get on early too, but I don't like to bug people. What was that, Jim? Uh, well, Dan uh, Johnson sent something. I'm yeah. not part of this presentation. Yeah, I moved them in by mistake. Oh, okay. Uh, anytime you're ready, Chair. All right, let's get going. Uh, Gary, what's up? Yes, uh, commissioners, you have a policy session, community greenhouse gas inventory. We have staff from transportation and development, sustainable sta sustainability and solid waste program. I'm not sure who's starting, so whoever's starting staff, please go ahead. Hi, everybody. It is Cheryl, and I'm going to be starting us off today. Um, it's nice to see you. I have you on a little bit of a smaller screen, so hopefully I catch everybody. Um, we're excited to be here with you today to present the results of this, green, uh, this community-wide greenhouse gas inventory, as it'll be a foundational document for the Climate Action Plan. Um, presenting today, since we're on a Zoom call, is um, Evan Polk, Sustainability Supervisor, Sarah Allison, Sustainability Analyst. We're also pleased to have Dr. Sarah Present, our Public Health Officer, joining us. Our climate work is a collaboration with many departments and Dr. Present is part of the Climate Action Steering Committee and a key cross-departmental member as climate really impacts many sectors of the work the county does like public health. Also joining us today but not presenting is Aaron Tonys um, from The Good Company. Um, the Good Company is the consulting firm that developed the greenhouse gas inventory and Aaron will be available for questions during our discussion today. So before we dive into our topic, I want to give you a quick update on the status of the Climate Action Plan. Um, the RFP to hire the consultant was posted on May 28th, and it'll be open for bidding until July 9th. Um, this was a little bit later and a little bit longer than we planned, but this is in response to the COVID-19 epidemic and really how it's impacting Procurement 360 it's, um, and, and for our consultants as well. So as we look towards development of the Climate Action Plan, which is a performance clock in this goal for the Board of County Commissioners, um, last October, Sustainability and Solid Waste contracted with the Good Company to develop this community-wide greenhouse gas inventory. So as you'll hear today, a greenhouse gas inventory measures a community or an organization's carbon footprint or their contribution to climate change through emissions um, of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and methane. Inventories like this are an essential part of developing a climate, climate action plan as they estimate greenhouse gases produced by specific activities in the community. And then they ultimately help us to create a plan to develop and prioritize actions to reduce those emissions and meet the, co the goal of being carbon neutral by 2050. So when we look at the board's goal and we talk in performance Clackamas language, the greenhouse gas inventory is a metric or a result. And in this case, um, carbon emissions is what we will be tracking. So this report will help us know where we are and establish a baseline for this metric so we can chart a path to where we wanna be in achieving the board's goal. So this greenhouse gas inventory process will be reoccurring as we engage in climate change. In reviewing this inventory, it's also important to have a context of how this information fits in the overall climate action planning process. While the inventory contains important information about our community's energy use and our emissions, this document in itself doesn't determine actions or next steps. 
because in addition to reducing greenhouse gases, there are important considerations for developing and prioritizing um, actions, including their feasibility, community engagement, which is a big part of our climate action plan, and how different actions can benefit community health, resiliency, and prosperity. So really, the information in this inventory that you're gonna to hear today will be used by the climate action plan consultant that we will hire to understand our community's baseline carbon emissions, draft potential actions or strategies, and then reduce climate impact. Sorry, my phone's ringing, sorry about that. Um, today's policy session is informational, so you get to sit back and relax, and um, we're gonna provide the board with a general understanding of the results of the inventory, information on how inventory is conducted, and then context for the climate action planning process ahead. So realize that today there's no action the board needs to take, and really there's no action you can take until we've created the climate action plan. But in the future, we'll be coming to you as the plan gets developed, um, us as staff and as the plan's consultants, because we'll be seeking your direction in the future on the actions and the work plan needed to achieve your goal of carbon neutrality. In your board packets today, um, you do have the full report. We're gonna be giving an overview of that report. But after today's policy session, and as you have time to digest this pretty healthy report, if you have additional questions coming out of today's discussion, staff are happy to help and assist you in any way. So with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Sarah Eben and Dr. Present who are gonna present this inventory overview and the results. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Um, so before Evan shares more about the results of the inventory, um, I would like to provide a, a framework for what is included in this particular document. So the geographic boundary for the report is Clackamas County, and that includes all of the cities and the unincorporated areas. Now, our initial hope was to provide detailed results for the county as a whole, as well as for individual cities. However, due to limitations of the data, we were only able to provide city emissions in terms of averages for the county based on populations. The inventory looks at emissions for the calendar year of 2018, and the inventory um, calculates emissions based on sources. So specifically, that's looking at buildings, which refers to the energy to heat, cool, and power buildings, and the equipment associated with those buildings. Transportation, so that's fuel for both on and off-road vehicles, and electricity emissions for uh, electric vehicles. Waste, which is the emissions from landfills and from wastewater treatments. Industry and refrigerants, which refers to chemical processes, not the energy use for those particular activities. Um, household goods and services, which are things that residents buy, but that aren't produced within the county. So this is a less precise category, but as you'll see, it's a very significant portion of our community's carbon footprint. We also cover air travel, and this is separate from transportation because it covers flights from airports that are outside of the county. Um, upstream energy production, so the making of fuels and natural gas and transmission losses from electricity. And Eben will be looking at all of these categories in more detail. And so when you think about what the inventory measures, it's looking at greenhouse gases, which there are six of, but it converts them all to a common measurement. And so the of those six, the four most common um, greenhouse gases are shown on the slide. Um, but they each have a different global warming potential, so they all impact the environment differently. But in order to simplify the reporting, all of those gases are converted into what we call metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. So the amount of carbon dioxide that it would take to have the same warming effect in the atmosphere. So because of that conversion, the inventory uses carbon and carbon footprint as a shorthand for all greenhouse gases. So that is language that you will hear throughout this presentation. And now Eben will take a closer look at the results of our specific inventory. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's good to see you today. Uh, again, uh, my name is Eben Polk, and I'm the sustainability supervisor at the county. Um, before getting into uh, the results, I, I also do want to um, thank and appreciate Sarah for her work managing this project and also um, Aaron and Claudia at Good Company for their work in, uh, you know, completing this first time inventory for our countywide community. So this has been a, a big learning experience for us. 
So you're, you're looking at the high level results slide here. And I'll spend a little more time on this probably than um, most of our other slides. So we estimate that in 2018, Clackamas County as a community was responsible for just over 7.1 million metric tons of carbon or carbon CO2 equivalents uh, in, in greenhouse gas emissions. That includes both what we emit within our community and also the carbon pollution that occurs when all the products and services that we consume are produced and, and just distributed to us. So you're looking at a pie, pie chart with several sources of greenhouse gas pollution, uh, those mentioned and described by Sarah just a moment ago. Uh, there's a few, way to few ways to slice these results. Uh, one way is to talk about the results in a couple of categories. Uh, in, in this lens, we, we divide it up between the emissions that come directly from within the boundaries of our county or that are emitted um, outside of our county boundary but are directly linked to our consumption of electricity and natural gas or gasoline in our community. Um, those are all the categories on the right side of this pie chart that you're looking at. Those are typically referred to as local or as sector-based emissions because they're broken out into sectors like buildings transportation, waste, et cetera. And as you can see, those emissions are about half of our carbon footprint as a community. And on the left side, you'll see um, that almost half of the total refers to imported emissions. Uh, you might also hear these referred to in other conversations as embodied emissions or as consumption-based emissions. Um, so if you buy let's say steel or maybe a vehicle made in the Midwest or uh, shoes manufactured in Southeast Asia or tomato grown in California, you're buying a product that has its own environmental footprint. And part of that is the fossil fuels and greenhouse gas emissions that it took to produce and deliver that item to you. So this red section here uh, refers to the carbon emissions that are embodied in those goods and services, uh, even if they're produced elsewhere um, because they're consumed here. So, those are, those are also someone else's direct local sector-based emissions, but we include them in an inventory like this because um, as buyers of the goods and services, we also bear some responsibility. So that's one way to slice these results. Uh, another way to slice these results is which come from fossil fuels and which don't. So if you look at the emissions on the right side of this pie chart, our, our local or sector-based emissions, 90% of those come from fossil fuel combustion. That's gasoline, natural gas, uh, coal for electricity, uh, diesel, propane, etc. And the other 10% is uh, from other sources that we'll talk about in the next few slides. So uh, let's put that, uh, that second number in context. Uh, that second number being the um, the emissions footprint that Clackamas County has if you ex exclude the imported emissions. So our, our direct and local uh, sector-based emissions, that's about 3.8 million uh, metric tons. So uh, wanna, with the caveat that how we compare with others really doesn't matter as much as how we are doing compared with our own long-term goal of being carbon neutral. Uh, if you take our, our 3.8 million metric tons of emissions in 2018 and you divide that out on a per person basis, you'll see that Clackamas County has about 9.1 metric tons of CO2 equivalent per year per person. Uh, compare that to the global average of five metric tons, and, and you can compare that as well to the US average of uh, 16 and a half tons. So we're somewhere in between, and if we, if we cut our carbon footprint by half, we would still be close to what the global average is. And of course, our 2050 goal that you have set is carbon neutral. Uh, which means that, in effect, we need to get those net emissions down to zero. If you wanted to visualize what a metric ton of CO2 looks like, um, it would fill a, a cube about 27 feet on each side. So that's kind of the, uh, the volume uh, associated with that carbon. Uh, another way to put our footprint in context is that uh, the county's carbon footprint is equivalent to the carbon absorbed by 5 million acres of average U.S. forest land. That's about four times uh, the size of Clackamas County. So again, before we move on to the next slide, I just want to emphasize that um, we think the most meaningful benchmark for us is against uh, our own goals over time. 
and that's getting to carbon neutral by 2050. So Sarah, could you go to the next slide? So we can talk for just a moment about buildings. Energy use associated with buildings is responsible for one quarter of Clackamas County's carbon footprint. That's basically all fossil fuels. That's natural gas to heat our buildings, uh, coal and natural gas used to generate electricity that we then use to light and heat and cool our buildings and to run uh, things like the uh, devices that we're all looking at right now. And then of course, things like uh, heating oil and propane, which are um, used in smaller amounts, but those would still show up here in this category. The next category on the next slide is transportation energy. So that's one fifth of our overall emissions. And this also is all from fossil fuels. It's from gasoline and diesel uh, combusted directly in internal combustion engines used to uh, push our vehicles around the county. And uh, a very small amount of energy for transportation comes from electricity and natural gas as well. The next slide shows us that we have some small contributors that are in general not fossil fuels, uh, but they are something for us to, to look at, understand, and, and eliminate in the future. Uh, waste and refrigerants um, and agriculture are all uh, sources of emissions that really don't relate to fossil fuel combustion, uh, but instead from different chemical processes. So for example, livestock, um, cattle uh, emit methane, uh, landfills emit methane, wastewater treatment plants emit methane and nitrous oxide. Uh, and we also have uh, chemical refrigerants that um, while relatively scarce in, uh, in terms of volume, uh, when they're released to the atmosphere, they can be um, many thousand times more impactful uh, in terms of global warming potential than uh, the same amount of carbon dioxide. So those are, those are our main sources of direct local um, or sector-based emissions, as we call them. So we'll talk a little bit more about the big red slice, uh, the 49% or so of emissions coming from consumption. So as mentioned, we're talking here about embodied um, emissions or imported emissions that are associated with the energy and other greenhouse gases uh, that, that are emitted as the goods and services that we consume here in our community are produced um, when they're produced outside our community. Excuse me. Uh, so I've given you some examples of those and just want to note here, uh, I think Sarah alluded to this, that the data we are talking about to, re to come up with this estimate is pretty meaningfully different than the data we use to estimate our sector-based emissions. Uh, so for example, while estimating emissions from our use of electricity or gasoline, it's really a simple matter of having the best data you can on how much of those sources we use and then doing some math. Uh, and those data are, are available through a relatively small number of pretty reliable sources like Portland General Electric. Um, and, and so in comparison, this slice of emissions is a, is a rougher estimate. To get this estimate, you start with what we know about how much Oregonians spend on different consumer items. And then you use that data um, and multiply it by, by some figures that Oregon DEQ has estimated. Uh, that that gives you a life cycle carbon footprint tied to a dollar of spending in a given emissions category, like concrete. So um, it's a, just a fundamentally different type of data that we're using. Okay, so let's move on to um, the next slide. This is the same results uh, that you've seen in the, in the pie chart, just shown in a different format. Next one forecast. So we also asked Good Company to give us a sense of where we're headed. Um, this slide shows us a few different versions of the future. The red dotted line shows us our trajectory if we continue um, in, in sort of growing in the same way that we are right now. Um, that reflects population growth and the same amount of emissions per person over time out to the future. The yellow 
dotted line shows us the goal that uh, the state of Oregon has set for our emissions trajectory that, that would be needed to meet statewide goals. And then the wedges of color show you where we think our emissions will go in Clackamas County uh, based on the policy instruments uh, that have been passed at the state and federal level. So if we can go to the next, yeah, the last slide here in my section. This is based on the same data that we were just looking at, but the, the picture is compressed a little bit. And the colorful wedges there are, are not uh, emissions, um, but they're actually emissions reductions. So you can see, for example, that the blue wedge here is how much below our business as usual forecast we're likely to be as a result of Oregon's renewable portfolio standard, which is cleaning up our electrical uh, grid. And then the green wedge shows the emissions, that, the emissions reductions that would result uh, from fuel economy standards at the federal level and also Oregon's clean fuels program. And then finally, the last two wedges uh, get to what the emissions benefits will be of the International Montreal Protocol, uh, which addresses, I believe, refrigerants. And then um, Oregon's, if we, may, if we met our statewide food waste diversion and reduction goals, you'd see a reduction, that little yellow bar at the bottom. A takeaway from this is that the existing policies in place are, are not gonna be enough to meet either the statewide Oregon goals or Clackamas County's carbon neutral, carbon neutral goal, excuse me. And that is another driving reason behind our climate, in, uh, climate action plan process. I think I will stop there and turn it over to Dr. Present. Thank you, Eben, and thank you uh, to all the commissioners for having us here today. Um, I know you have all seen a lot more of me than typical in the last several months during the COVID pandemic. Um, and I want to acknowledge that it's not usually in the context of climate or sustainability work, uh, but I personally believe that all this work is really closely connected. Um, I've served as the public health and the H3S representative to the climate exchange for a bit over a year at least, um, and I sit on the steering committee as well. I do this for many reasons, including the fact that controlling greenhouse gas emissions and their effects on our climate is intricate, I can't speak, intricately intertwined with uh, public and individual health. So much of our public health is directly related to environmental influences, including air quality, the built environment, and ecology. Um, I, wanna, I wanna talk about COVID-19 and our uh, climate action plan a little bit. So the COVID-19 pandemic has hit a really interesting point in our county's timeline for producing our updated climate action plan. And while a global health pandemic is clearly not the ideal way to implement changes in emissions, there is a lot that we can learn about what we have observed during the time that we have been under Governor Brown's stay home and stay healthy orders. Um, and it's really important to think about these as we consider uh, sustainability and climate resiliency moving into a new normal. Uh, as we recover from the initial effects of the response to the pandemic, which have slowed the spread of disease, but have also really significantly impacted our economy, um, I would like to advocate that our new normal be more sustainable and resilient um, and have an overall reduction in greenhouse gases, ideally. And I think that there are ways to do that. So a couple of key factors that we've noticed um, during the last few months are the effects of telecommuting. So we've had a significant decrease in traffic and uh, emissions with an increase in telecommuting. And while there's, some, um, there's also some emerging suggestion that many sectors have increased rather than decreased work efficiency with telecommuting. Um, decreased emissions help slow the climate effects, but also protects individuals from respiratory damage that it can actually worsen COVID-19 risks. So limiting pollution at this time has multiple benefits. Um, I think that going into this process, we really need to evaluate the utility of maintaining some level of tele telecommunicating going forward as one of the options. Um, we also have to think about our uh, potential need for increased vehicles in certain sectors, um, including ancestral workers who, um, who carpool or who uh, take um, mass transit who need to social distance. So there's a lot of sort of balancing in transportation options that we are learning a lot about um, in our response that will help us um, move forward. 
The, um, the effects of the pandemic have also highlighted some vulnerabilities in our supply chain, including our food supply. Um, I'd like to encourage us to look um, more into localizing resources, both for economic and physical health, um, including um, capitalizing on our amazing local food supply so that we could be more resilient going into the future to climate change effects um, and also decrease our, our transportation emissions. So again, we're not making recommendations today um, or during this presentation, but the pandemic has made a lot of changes in how we do things. And these will be taken into account in our work with the consultant as we uh, develop the climate action plan. So uh, back to the slide here, the climate action plan request for proposals was posted on May 28th. It will be open until July 9th. Um, the things that we have learned, um, including what I just mentioned, but also the greenhouse gas inventory, which was done prior to, all of these will, will, take, um, will be taken into consideration in our work with the consultant on coming up with the climate action plan. Um, and again, we don't like learning from um, a tragedy and a disaster like this, but we must learn in order to support the community well-being and the viability of our, our decisions in the next coming months. And I will pass it back to Eben to wrap us up. All right, well, to revisit the high level results, we can say that the largest sources of emissions in the Clackamas County community are from buildings, uh, transportation, particularly our use of gasoline, uh, our consumption of materials and services uh, and goods. And then um, we can also acknowledge that our uh, state and federal policies will deliver, as long as they are faithfully implemented, uh, a, a meaningful reduction in our community's greenhouse gas footprint. Uh, but those reductions will not be sufficient to meet the state of Oregon's own goals, uh, and they will also not be uh, sufficient to meet our local goal of carbon neutral by 2050. And then just thinking about the value of this inventory in general, um, this is something that we should expect to repeat. Um, I'm not exactly sure on what frequency, but we should be expecting to repeat this so that we can track how we are doing in reaching our own goals and we can track the results of the programs and policies that Clackamas County might consider to build upon the, the policies that we're seeing at the state and federal level. And so uh, the inventory deliverables that we got from Good Company uh, will help us track that. And uh, inventories are also going to be a helpful tool as we look at the potential benefits of different policy actions that we could consider as part of a climate action plan. We'll be able to take a look at uh, what different levels of implementation or types of, of programs and policies could make uh, different levels of contribution to the, to the solutions we're looking for. So that's our uh, presentation to you on, on our first ever greenhouse gas inventory. Um, this is a big milestone for us and we look forward to uh, talking with you now um, and doing our best to answer what questions you might have. Thanks. I think I saw Paul's hand up. Yeah, um, Evan, can you roll the slide deck back to maybe the first or second slide? Sure, Sarah has control on the slides, just so you know. Uh, next one, next one, that one, okay. Um, it might seem like a, being a, it's important though. See that line that says nitrous oxide? These are often confused and it, the reason it's important to me is because when we talk um, about the other slide about gasoline and then diesel, I want to talk about that, but um, it's not, in, not nitrous oxide is not a um, is not the problem. It's the chemical name that we're dealing with for exhaust pollution is NO and NO2, um, which are considered the family name of NOx, nitrous of oxide. So nitrous oxide is there's a medical grade um, and there's a commercial grade, um, but nitrous oxide is not the target here. Um, it's it's nitrogens of oxide, both NO and NO2. So could you correct that slide, please? Well, um, and then if you could roll the, roll the slide deck back to um, the last slide, the highlights, the one that was titled highlights. So transportation's use of gasoline. Is there a reason that diesel's not 
part of that. Um, I know we have both diesel and gas powered um, vehicles in our fleet, but I've always found um, chemically that um, diesel exhaust is probably one of the most dangerous fuels. It is a known carcinogen. And, um, you know, in our buses that pick up our kids and um, pick up our waste in front of our homes and uh, truck our waste out to uh, down the, the, uh, the gorge um, and marine uses, uh, diesel's a bad actor. And I'm just kind of wondering why we don't have diesel included there. Well, I'll, I'll just clarify. Um, thank you, Commissioner. The inventory results do include diesel. Um, and uh, we could go back to the report itself and identify that number. It, it's simply that um, if you're looking at the largest sources, um, gasoline is, is just a bigger consumption factor in our community uh, than diesel. As we all know, um, it's just you know, kind of visually apparent in our community that um, diesel is a, a, a smaller percentage of our transportation energy use. Um, and then to your point, sir, about the um, nit nitrous oxide, uh, you're right, this greenhouse gas pollutant uh, chart that we were showing up there, nitrous oxide is a different chemical and we're not talking about emissions from cars there. It's, it's more about um, emissions from, for example, the application of fertilizer. Uh, Aaron Tonys, if, if, uh, are you on? Would you like to speak a little bit to uh, the sources of nitrous oxide as a, as a greenhouse gas? He'll be here shortly. Okay. Hello, can everybody hear me now? Yep. All right, fantastic. Um, let me start my video. Um, so nitrous oxide, um, is defined in greenhouse gas protocol as one of one of the the six greenhouse gases. Um, it's also a NOx. NOx uh, has a different set of emissions, and those are criteria air pollutants. Um, we are talking about nitrous oxide here. Um, it, it's defined in, by the Kyoto Protocol as a greenhouse gas, um, and so is is included here. NOx are uh, as a group of of emissions. Um, certainly cause other issues, uh, but the one we're looking at here is nitrous oxide. That's H2O. Now that would be naturally occurring nitrous oxide? Sorry, so nitrous oxide comes from a, a variety of sources. Uh, it is a byproduct of fossil fuel combustion, uh, much smaller in scale than carbon dioxide. Methane is also a byproduct of fossil fuel combustion. And as, as Evan said, uh, nitrous oxide is also coming from agricultural sources, um, application of fertilizers. I'd, I'd love to, to maybe get your sources for that, because um, while the presentation was being made, I've been looking at nitrous oxide and, you know, throughout and, um, um, I'm not finding it in the, in the, in that category of fertilizer. Um, um, but I, I do find NO and NO2, but not N2O. Yeah, I, sir, I'd be happy to uh, share the protocol with you. I mean, that, that, sure. that is the basis of, of the inventory, the, the, the global protocol for community scale inventories. Um, ha happy to share that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I, I'd be I'd be interested. I just don't want people to um, confuse the. Well, it's very easily, very easy to confuse the two. And I'm just trying to always been trying to prevent that. But if there yeah. is, is, is a distinction and more focus on on N2O, then I would certainly like to know the where I can find the resource for that. Sure, I, I'd be happy to share it with Sarah, and she can distribute. Uh, the The protocol lays out um, the gases. Uh, that you include. It's, it's a little like the protocol is a little like the tax code is for taxes. Um, it's the rules we followed to do the inventory. It defines the gases and then it gives emissions factors for different sources. Um, and for some of those sources, nitrous oxide is, is a gas. Right. That's, but do you know, can you, can you speak to the resource itself? Where does it come from? 
you said it comes from the the the, fer, the chemicals that make fertilizer. Uh, for for agriculture, um, there, there's a factor applied when when nitrogen is um, land applied uh, to the soil. It it ends up being a fraction of the total nitrogen applied to the soil. For combustion of fossil fuels, uh, there there are emissions factors um, for carbon dioxide and for methane and nitrous oxide for each of those. Uh, so there's emissions factors per gallon uh, of fuel combusted uh, or per kilowatt hour of electricity generated. Um, uh, there, there are emissions, yes, it, it is a, a recognized greenhouse gas and, and there are emissions factors uh, for the sources where, where it is that. I'm happy right. to share more information. Uh, uh, yeah, thank, thank you. The science lesson offline. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm looking it up myself. It's commonly uh, called laughing gas. It is. Yep, that's right. So um, I I had a question of using 2018 data. Is that because it takes that long to get that data? So it's two years old. That's what I thought. Because you know, I, and this, I I don't buy fresh fish anymore because they fly it in from, you know, all over the world. When you can buy frozen fish, it has its carbon footprint is, is much less, at least that's my understanding. So uh, anyway, I, there's a lot we could do. So, I mean, a suggestion I know as we go into the future is uh, where can we, how can we buy at a grocery store uh, things that would reduce our carbon footprint. And my small one is I don't buy fresh fish anymore. Anyway, uh, any other questions? Don't see any hands up. Well, this is great information. Uh, I know that the uh, the communities, uh, when uh, Cheryl was at uh, talked to Steve Bohr, everyone was really excited about about uh, the inf about the study and participating. I was a bit surprised myself, weren't you, Cheryl? Yeah, yeah, no, they. It was a good discussion. People were really engaged in the conversation. It was great. Um, it was it was good to hear so much support for the work and wanting to partner so closely too. Um, TriMet's reached out to us and a couple other people since that C4 meeting, so we're excited about the results. Right. Yeah, there, there was one other note I made I forgot to mention, and that is that, uh, and I brought this up Thursday night at C4, and that is that um, the um, another advantage of expanding broadband wherever we can and engaging in um, activities such as, um, you know, virtual meetings and um, uh, it'd be online learning, online working, online shopping, all those things uh, to reduce uh, vehicle traffic. And then of course, the, the, um, um, our carbon footprint thereof. Um, it would be a great benefit. I think we've, we've probably seen that obviously. And I don't know what, uh, if anyone's done the math, the rough macro math or big math on maybe what we've seen and, and CO2 reduction as a result of all the um, barrels of oil that haven't been processed and burned, but it's got to be a significant, uh, a significant reduction, though temporary. Um, uh, I'd be interested in knowing if anyone's done that math as of yet. But uh, I just did want to just capitalize on 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 that aspect. And um, and is there any any work? I had a question. Is there any work on the the effects of metropolitan environments, um, microclimates? Uh, where big, big buildings are heat reservoirs and contribute to health factors, um, so forth, um, and added added need for refrigerants and so forth. I'm not. Are you talking specifically for Clackamas County or just kind of in general, Commissioner? No, I think there's a there's a um, uh, you know in the industry in the refrigeration industry there's been a recognition a number one has always been considered and been targeted for improvements in different chemicals that don't contribute to ozone holes in the ozone and and uh, things that that uh, occur atmospherically but also that the um, the per capita need for more refrigerant um, and cooling 
um, and metropolitan environments because of the heat soak effect and the microclimate, whereas a metropolitan area, let's just say New York City, for example, um, that the more metropolitan it may be, um, that the more need for refrigerants and the impacts on the environment thereof. Has anyone done that work? I'm not aware. Um, experts on the call? Yeah, I'm seeing Evan shaking his head. Um, no, I, you know, I have seen work on the health effects of, of heat in general and heat deserts and the use of air conditioning as additional factors to outdoor temperature, but the actual use of refrigerants, I have myself not seen, seen yeah. the effects of that in particular. I'm you know, it's also further aggravated by the need for energy for electricity to power the air conditioning unit. So it's a, it's a multiplying, there's a multiplier for that. Okay, thank you. Well, if there's no more questions, I move that we uh, speed up high speed internet uh, throughout the county. Chair, we have Commissioner Humberston with his hand raised. <laughs> Ken. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your comments on ISP. Uh, needless to say, I'm on board. Uh, the, with respect to the presentation today, Evan, I uh, was very impressed with what you've gotten done so far. Uh, after we get our consultant on board and get some results, quite frankly, and this may not surprise you at all, I look forward to very specific recommendations of things that we can actually do and get our hands around. Um, pass the talk and on to the action, if you will. We do, we do too, Commissioner. We're looking forward to getting started in the climate action and actually starting to get some measures and goals that Great. we can talk about. Um, I'm assuming that you are including residents of our community who are very, very interested in this process um, and, and at, at least semi-regular meetings. Yeah, we just started. In fact, our um, the the web page for the climate action plan is now up on the county website, and that is um, being um, a great place to get information. We have a new we have an email list that we just started, so we're sending regular updates to the community, and we heard back from people from our um, we publicized that this was happening, and so we've heard back from them already. And then as we go into the climate action plan, that's the first job for the consultant. <laughs> is to help us develop our community outreach, including a task force that'll be working with us throughout this project. All right, and hopefully they develop catalytic converters for cows. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, of course. All right, if there's no more questions, thank you very much. Look forward to more information in the future. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. I really appreciate your time today. It's great to be here. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you, team. All right, uh, Chair, if you agree, I'd like to go back to the issues list because we have about uh, 15 minutes before our next policy session. Is that all right? All right, I will start with myself and these will be quick updates for you. First, uh, commissioners, uh, non-represented employee cost of living increase or COLA. Uh, in 2018, you passed a resolution, you had a policy session and you passed a resolution that tied non-represented employee COLAs to the Consumer Price Index West Urban Rate as reported by the U.S. Department of Labor, um, and that would be automatic each year. Um, so since 2018 and you passed that resolution, um, the prior administrator and I did not go back to you for approvals, but I just wanted to check to see if that's still okay with you in which case I would just automatically approve the COLAs for non-represented employees, which would be 2.6%, which is the same that represented employees are receiving. This has already been budgeted. It's in the budget you just, the budget committee just approved. But I just want to check in with you if you are okay with this, or do you want a formal, a formal presentation at a business meeting for your authorization? I'm okay. <sighs> I don't feel you need to, but I want to make sure you're okay with the process. You passed a resolution two years ago, so now you would just automatically, we would follow that uh, CPI West Urban Rate, and that would be the non-represented That's the That's the new uh, CPI we're using for everybody else. Correct, yes. Yeah. Yes. Commissioner Savas. You're on mute, Commissioner. Uh, <clears throat> So my, just my one short question, uh, Gary, is is what's the difference between the two measurements? Is there a disparity? I, as far as the, the CPI West Urban Rate, I, I don't know. Uh, I thought they eliminated it. 
They eliminated the old, yes, the U.S. Department of Labor had a different methodology. Remember the staff, HR briefed you on this about two years ago. This is the new format that we're using here. Most jurisdictions in Oregon are using, certainly in Portland area cities and counties are using, and that you agreed we would use it here at Clackamas County as well. The West Urban Rate. I get you more details. I don't, that's limited my knowledge of memory of that. Well, yeah, because I, I, you know, you did give us the new rate, but I was just wondering if the, if any other rate that it was um, where it ranked, I just, just there's the economics of, of a dynamic change. It's not always, the coal is not always the same and it moves and they don't all move in the same categories the same either. So just curiosity, that's all. Sure. Okay uh, if I may, in 2018, the rate was 2.8%. Last year, 2019, it was 3.5%. And now in 2020, it's 2.6%. So it's the lowest of the, of the three years. Uh, so right. I, I'm just seeking your head nod. I'm going to go ahead as because you already gave direction two years ago to automatically use the CPI, which is what I intend to do. It's already been budgeted. If I don't see any objections, so I'll move forward. Then. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, uh, budget committee update. Um, there are two vacancies on the county budget committee as of June 30th. They are the seats of Wilda Parks and Sean Coldwell. Uh, so we have, as of last Thursday, publicized to the community. There are two vacancies on the county budget committee and those uh, positions are available uh, or people can apply until June 30th. I told several of you commissioners it was two weeks. I apologize, I was wrong. I double checked. The, the positions are open until the end of this month, June 30th. So if you know of anyone or anyone listening is interested in serving on the county budget committee, they may submit an application by June 30th. And then of course, commissioners, you'll see the names. And if you choose to interview candidates, you'll do that. And then we'll approve those as soon as we can in July. But just wanted to update you on those vacancies um, that are coming up. And we have already scheduled monthly meetings with the budget committee as you requested, starting in July and uh, for six months. Um, I think it's on a Tuesday, I recall, um, afternoon, once a month. So both the former, I mean, both Will and Sean know that they need to reapply. They have been notified, and I believe they both have submitted their applications to reapply. Uh, but it's open to anyone, and not, yeah. it's not an automatic reappointment. They have to apply, and any other community member may also apply. Yep. So just an update for you there. Uh, next, your board retreat. So commissioners, you are going to have a team building board retreat in March that was postponed due to COVID. And we have continued to postpone it, but now I'm asking if you would like to revisit holding your retreat in the month of July that you would do face to face and we would ensure there was proper social distancing. Um, and it would just be the five of you, myself, Stephen Madcor, and the facilitator. So eight, you know, eight people total. Um, I, I highly recommend you do this. You still have six and a half months of working together with this current team. Uh, uh, this mostly will be a team building retreat. But also, I would like to have a conversation with myself and you on change strategy and how to manage change at an organization. There's a lot of change going on in this organization. So that would be the purpose. But I'm asking your approval to move forward and hold a face-to-face -face board retreat in the month of July um, with just the board and a facilitator. Well, Ken, I know, really wants to do this. So, uh... Mr. Savitz? Um, I would... I would support that primarily because on behalf of the organization and also behalf of the administrator, um, I'm hoping that uh, whatever he has to, uh, to discuss with us, um, like organizational structures included and how we're gonna you know, adjust the organization, I think it's important that we do that uh, without delay. So for that reason, I support it. That would be part of the conversation, yes. Uh, so are, are you okay, commissioners? In the month of July, we'll work with your schedules. It'll be face-to-face, in-person, with appropriate social distancing. I'm not seeing any no's, so we'll plan that. Thank you. Um, next, um, I again, I want to be fully transparent, as I hope I always am, commissioners. I'm seeking your approval for the county to pay for me as county administrator to be a member of three professional organizations for county administrators and city managers. They are the International City and County Manager Association, the Oregon City County Manager Association, and the National Association of County Administrators. 
three organizations, the dues for those three organizations combined annually is $2,122, $2,100 for all three organizations. So I'm seeking your permission for the county to pay my professional dues for those three organizations. Um, I've been a member already for uh, actually in, in the International City Manager Association I joined before I was a manager, a county administrator because department directors are allowed to join and I paid at my own expense. But these have been very helpful organizations for me to help me in my professional development. But I don't want to assume that um, I can just join with using county dollars. So I'm seeking your approval to do that. You can use my travel budget uh, because we won't be traveling much <laughs> to pay those dues. Okay. Are you okay, commissioners, for me to uh, use county funds for my professional dues for these three organizations? Okay, thank you. Um, uh, next, uh, Adren, if you could bring in Caroline for small grants update. I'll do one more quick one. Your business meeting for this Thursday, uh, you have, of course, a COVID-19 update, uh, uh, potential approval of an addendum to the emergency declaration. You just added today a, discuss a resolution on race, racial injustice. You have a reading of a previously adopted land use ordinance on a comprehensive plan amendment for the Sandy Urban Growth Boundary. You have a public hearing, uh, first reading on amending the county code to add the county internal auditor language. Uh, you have, we'll meet as a Clackamas County Extension District for a resolution for a supplemental budget, greater than 10%. Uh, you will have approval of a regional wastewater system cooperative intergovernmental agreement, which you're gonna be briefed on here in a second, and a consent agenda. So you have quite a busy business meeting for Thursday. If you have any questions or comments, if you let me know prior to Thursday, we can get those answered to you before the meeting. So, uh, with that, I'll invite Caroline Hill, a policy advisor with the Board of County Commissioners, to give you an update on the 2020 Small Grants Program and seek your approval for perhaps a, uh, an update. Go ahead, Caroline. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners and Administrator Schmidt. I'm Caroline Hill from County Administration. I'm here today to talk about the 2021 2020-2021 small grants program and the direction you wish them to go this cycle. Last year's cycle, at the request of the board, the small grants committee gave priority to those applicants focusing on the community prosperity collaborative areas, although efforts were still made to ensure that the funds were spread throughout the county. That direction was based on the county's MFR. This year has brought different challenges for the various nonprofits servicing the communities of Clackamas County. A lot of the 2019 small grant recipients have informed me that they have been severely impacted by COVID-19. They are seeing an increase in requests for services while also having to adjust to the guidelines for social distancing. My question for you today is, would you like the 2020-2021 small grant cycle to be refocused to address issues caused by COVID-19? We could continue to focus on the community prosperity collaborative areas and just add another layer of priority to the, pro to the program. If this is something that you're interested in, I am ha I'm happy to come back at a policy session with a few recommendations for your consideration. Thank you. Chair Bernard? Um, I'd like to know what those issues are. Mm -hmm. So let's find out what they are. For me, uh, hunger is uh, like one of the top issues. That is uh, one actually, Chair. Uh, there, a lot of the nonprofits from last year saw a significant increase in requests for food. Yeah, and, and so those kind of things. The other thing might be, it's going to be a while before we solve homelessness. So it might be sleeping bags, tents, stuff like that. Um, you know, and I, I still think the prosperity areas are, are, are the most important, one of the most important, but everyone should be able to eat. Mm -hmm. In my nonprofit that I used to run, uh, that was always my priority that everyone should be able to eat. We can make it a very simple focus of giving priority to those organizations that provide food to the hungry, if you'd like. Well, continue to you know, provide as much funding for other services as well. But if, if it's a food oriented organization, we can of course give them priority. That's what the board wishes to do this year. It could be distribution of food that is, is given to those organizations too, but I don't know what everyone else thinks. 
Commissioner Fisher? Thank you. Um, I've been thinking a lot about our capacity in regards to our safety net, especially in light of the homeless services dollars that are going to be coming our way. And one thing that is very clear that I think we're all aware of is that our nonprofit sector um, needs some support. So I don't know if we should think about system improvement grants or capacity grants or things for our nonprofits for process improvement or whatever types of things they might need in order to improve operations or improve their capacity, effectiveness, efficiency. Um, it's something I'm going to have a conversation with, with Rich Swift here before too long. And I was going to mention that to him, but we do need strategies in Clackamas County about how do we help support our nonprofit infrastructure. Don't know if this grant is possibly a, an avenue. Well, I think that's why I suggest let's find out what their needs are. Some of it's going to be food. Some of it's going to be something else and try to focus. We want them around. We do. And if there's something we can do to keep them alive, we should do it. We do have a very short turnaround. We usually open up for applications on starting July 1st. But if you would like me to reach out to all my various contacts, uh, asking them how they have been affected by COVID-19 and if there's anything else that we can do to assist them, we can maybe perhaps push back the opening for applications a couple of weeks. That way I can collect some data for you. Might be a good idea. Martha. Mike. Good. Apologize, it's very noisy here. I've got somebody on my roof and something, never mind, just, just wait a minute. But Sonia, could you give me, when, when you're talking about capacity building, what specifically, what, give me an example of what you really mean by that. Like what, I mean, to hire more people to? Yeah, I don't really, I don't have the answers that would really need to be from the ground up saying this is what we would need, but I just know that we need more capacity in our nonprofit sectors in order to deliver the services of an ever growing county with greater complexity. So it's just a need that we have. And then with um, COVID, as Caroline has brought up, we have nonprofits that are really struggling. And so I'm not sure what an example might be, but I'm sure our nonprofits could give us. Yeah. <laughs> Some examples of what type of supports might be needed for their operations. Paul? Yeah, I just wanted just to, I guess, my, not that this is a question, I don't want to uh, belabor the whole thing, but I, it's probably if it's COVID, there might be some resources available for that are, that could help feed people as a result of the COVID um, impacts. So that might be one resource, but I think we need to be mindful of the resources and just remind my colleagues that the more efficient we are and the leaner we are, the more dollars we would have available and knowing our budget constraints. I think that's always, when we talk about these kinds of activities. I think it's, I, I think I'd like to know from the administrator or whoever the suggester is, what resources they're actually identifying available for that purpose. I'm not sure I understand what you're asking, but. Uh, basically, you know? what, what, if you have an idea for something, where's the money come from and how much money do we actually have? We budget 250. Okay. I, was, I, I, I think I heard one of our colleagues suggest beyond that 250 without saying that. Oh no. Okay. There's there's no, no there's no extra money laying around, commissioners, as you know. So oh. you have to <laughs> right. if you wanted to do that. But but what I guess what I am saying is from a from a COVID standpoint, if there are people that lost their job and they're hungry as a result of COVID, that might be uh, a resource available outside of the two fifty. Yeah, that's why I suggested maybe it's not food, it's delivery or it's uh, stuff like that. It might be that, uh, let's say, um, Colton Food uh, Bank has lots of food, but they need to get them to the people. 
Uh, it might be something like that. Uh, and then I think that, well, the nonprofits will tell us. I mean, yes, like, I can like, definitely do a quick, quick survey just asking them how they have been impacted by COVID and if there's anything that we could do differently in order, order to assist them. If, just keep it very simple and come back in a week or so with some information. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we talked about before is we don't want to like throw money to hire somebody for a month. No. That doesn't do any good. Uh, so it isn't about people as much as it's services or food or a roof or a refrigerator or something like that. Right. All right. Mr. Humberston. So I would suggest to Caroline uh, simply have a, a, a very simple question. Uh, given the size of our grant program, if a small grant would be helpful, what is your single greatest need at this time? Real basic question like that will get you a pretty good idea of exactly what's needed on the ground. All right, what, we got through that, anything else? So Caroline will come back to you commissioners, hopefully before the end of the month with a proposal for the new the grant program starting in July. Okay, thank great. Thank you, thank Caroline. You. All thank right. Uh, I now propose you go back to your uh, policy session list, commissioners, because it's time for your next policy session, which is uh, property disposition procedures amendment and property control transfer of corner park property from business and community services to Clackamas County Department of Transportation and Development. Uh, we have staff presenting our, let's see, uh, Lindsay uh, and Sarah from Business and Community Services. So as soon as you are ready, uh, Sarah or Lindsay, please take it away. Good morning. Okay, just checking if I see Lindsay now. Okay, <laughs> my eyes are scanning. Good afternoon, actually, commissioners. Uh, my name is Sarah Ackman. I'm the deputy director with Business and Community Services, and uh, I'm here today with Lindsay Wild with our property disposition section of the department, and she's going to be talking to you about the issues for this policy session. So, Lindsay. Hello. Um, so, we are just coming back to you. Basically, um, in December, we came to you and presented that Corner Park. Uh, which is currently um, being used by the Hamlet of Beaver Creek. Um, the control of that park be transferred over to DTD. Um, they are going to um, manage that um, piece of property in the interim. Uh, they do have in their master plan a um, proposal to do a roundabout in that area. Um, it's about 10 years out, so um, Anyhow, uh, during the process of the transfer of control, um, County Council came back and had us do a few uh, edits on our procedures. So that's what we're coming back to you today for just approval and then transferring over control instead of deeding the property over to DTD since it's already county owned. Okay. It's just a simple, simple change. So we're just gonna say yes or no? I, I believe so. <laughs> yes. Oh, Ken. Thank you. <laughs> um, in the interim, you say it's about 10 years out uh, for any work to be done? Correct, and that's that's according to Dan Johnson, who's the director of DTD. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't have their specific, um, master plan in front of me, but um, in speaking to him, he said that and they can take control of the piece of property, allow the use, um, the conditional use that the Hamlet uses the piece of property for, um, and then um, down the road, um, you know, that also gives the Hamlet time to move their meeting place, uh, wherever that may be, and, um, and then, and then in the long run, then DTD then has ownership of or control of that piece of property. So then when it comes time to put in the roundabout on that corner of Leland and Beaver Creek by the Grange right there, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. Um, Very. Great. <laughs> then they already have, um, they already have control of the piece of property and then that piece of property will house um, equipment and um, 
part of the property will then be used for road right of way purpose as well. Okay, well that answered my question. I want to be sure that the community can continue to use it in the interim. Yeah. That, that, that it's, it's really used for social uh, events outdoors. It's not a meeting place per se. And uh, I know that there's great interest in it. Um, if that plan should ever change, I would hope that the uh, Hamlet would be consulted because uh, I know they'd be interested in the property uh, at some point in time. I realize that's probably not feasible at the moment, but should, should our plans ever change as a county, uh, that should be considered. Absolutely. Um, and we've gone through many different scenarios and trying to get them uh, control of the property. And it's just like you said, it wasn't feasible at this time. But uh, in order for them to continue to use the property for their, you know, they have a bazaar, they have a Christmas um, yep. flea market type thing, they have, you know, things like that. Um, in order for them to continue to use the property, we had to transfer control from property disposition, which tax foreclosure, over to DTD. That was the only way we could do it for right now. So. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so we're good with that, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Do you need a motion? Uh, yes, please, yes. <laughs> and there are, to approve. there are two requests here. One is to change the actual um, uh, procedures, and the second is to allow the transfer of the park. Move second. to approve both. Second, second. <laughs> it's removed and second to approve the changes to transfer and to transfer. Mm -hmm. Right? To approve the disposition, so to, you're amending the property disposition procedures yes. and you're transferring control of Corner Park. All right. Any further discussion? All those in, oh wait, Polis. Thank you. Commissioner Savas? Aye. Commissioner Humberston? Aye. Mr. Fisher? Aye. Commissioner Schrader? Doc Bark. Skip for now. Chair Bernard? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thanks. All right. See you later. Sure, Lindsay, Thanks. very much. All right. Um, that is the end of your policy sessions. We're now going back to the issues list. Uh, first, uh, advisory boards and commissions. So, commissioners, I apologize. Uh, there was a, a computer glitch and you did not get your ABC paperwork until this morning. So if you would like more time, we can postpone these appointments until next week. Or if you've had a chance to read them from this morning, we can go ahead and, and seek your approval now. What would you like to do? I, I have not seen them yet. Thank you. I haven't either. All right. We'll, we'll postpone them until next week. Again, we apologize. It was it was a computer glitch, not, not a staff issue. The computer disappeared, hid it from us all. So we'll just postpone those to next week. Uh, we have two more issues that I need staff to attend. They've been notified. Oh, Stephen's here, so if you could bring him in, please. Uh, Drenda. So mm -hmm. first, commissioners, uh, abandon RVs. You've been approached by several members of our community about what is the county doing for abandoned RVs. So Stephen can update you on what your options are. So Stephen, please go ahead. Yeah, hi. We haven't really done much with RVs except for a case-by-case -case basis. It depends on where the RV has been parked. Recently, we've had some parked on county property. That one makes it a bit clearer and easier. I understand that this most recent one is parked on a road or somebody's driveway or something along those lines. Um, the problem with RVs in removing them is that it's going to be the cost associated with it. Plan on probably 500 to 1,000 bucks to dispose of the RV, depending upon how big it is, depending upon the condition of the interior as well. They consider these things hazardous waste for a number of reasons. Usually they've been used, um, uh, drug use has taken place within an RV. They'll find hypodermic needles, they might find human waste, they might find other trash but the RV itself, many of them have asbestos in there for insulation. And so that adds to the cost to dismantle and salvage these, these uh, units. And there's only one place in Portland Metro uh, that, that I understand that actually will agree to take these and strip them and salvage them and dispose of them. 
So it's a option available to you. It's just a matter of money. Typically what we find when we do a registration search, it would be that the person whose name is on the registration would say, oh, I sold that five years ago, or I gave it to so-and-so. Um, and there's the chain of title has been kind of severed and we don't necessarily know who abandoned the vehicle. So we won't be able to have anybody per se to go after for any type of effort to collect or reimburse the county for any costs associated with it. So um, that's essentially an update on it. And if it is a, a public property or even on private, if we were gonna tow it, we'd have to post it. We would have to do our due diligence with uh, doing a registration scan, giving folks notice to the extent possible. Um, and that would take some time and uh, staff effort as well. We can't just tow them in, uh, uh, on ODOT and leave them? ODOT property? You know, um, probably not. We would be just as bad as the person that abandoned them in the first place. I know Portland has a lot of problems with yeah. these, so we're lucky that it's, we only have a few. I see them on 99 and usually somebody strips them out while they're parked there near Canby. So are, do you have a question here or is this just an update? I, I, I don't, I was just giving you an update because I know that you had during your last board meeting, I think yeah, somebody Paul called had, in. Yeah, Paul had oh, something on okay. it. Paul? You're on mute. Commissioner. Yeah, yeah, I wanted, just wanted to point out there's, I, while I know that we have a case here and a case there, there's probably more out there than we have. As, as Stephen properly said, this is a, a liability. And in fact, um, the same applies for boats, fiberglass boats. So not all motor homes are made out of fiberglass, but a lot of them are. And, and uh, I'll just tell you that people are looking, they're finding out that, that they, when they want to get rid of their boat, that it's like five, I've heard numbers like up to five to $7,000 for someone to pay the hazardous waste fee for just a fiberglass boat. And if we start doing that and people find, a, a, if we start paying it ourselves, I think we're going to see a lot more people dumping their fiberglass vehicles. And that's a, that's a burden we can't afford. So it has to go back to some kind of title trace to some degree, but I don't have the answer, um, but we need to find one. We just can't have our county polluted by people dumping their vehicles, uh, boats or RVs or otherwise. Commissioner Humberston? Yeah, as my understanding is when you sell a vehicle, you are required to then tell DMV you sold the vehicle. It's a form you fill out. I've done that a couple of times uh, here. And so obviously, it doesn't matter whether they have the paperwork or not, or they say they sold it or not. The last person that had it registered, if they didn't fill out that piece of paper, should be liable for it. So why can't we go after them? Oh, well, we could. We haven't had a situation that required it so far. We had, um, we had one, one vehicle. When you say go after them, I mean you're talking about like we would pay for it first and then do a small claims action against them or something. Is that something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Those are policy decisions for you guys. If you wanted to devote those resources to it, we certainly could do it. We the last one we had, county admin paid to have it towed from the tech services lot. So we've had one. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks for the information. If it happens again, we'll come back to you. Perfect. <laughs> Gary, what's next? Uh, so just to, to close the loop here, are you, so there's been one, one, uh, one citizen in particular who's been very uh, insistent on asking the county to do something. So was our response that we are not going to do something in this instance? What I recommend, Gary, is how about you let me get, I'll be in touch, give me the guy's detail, his info. I will see if we can track down, like Ken said, the registration, the last registration, and we'll at least put the person who last registered this vehicle on notice that that's what it's there and that he or she is responsible for it. And I'll, we'll send out some type of letter first and see what happens, if anything. Let them know that the fine's five times more expensive than just getting doing, doing what they should have done in the <laughs> first place. <laughs> All right, thank, great, thank you. Great. Thank you, Stephen. 
there is uh, one more issue that I'm waiting for Greg Geist. He's on his way, but he's not here yet. So well, let me ask, can I ask uh, uh, County uh, Council a question again? So um, I believe that during the budget discussion, we talked about line items, for example, in an elected official's budget uh, that let's say we budgeted uh, $5 million to, uh, to buy, uh, to hire 10 employees. And uh, that elected official decided to hire three of them. Uh, so he, they didn't spend all the money uh, or they hired eight of them instead of five. They would have to request a budget adjustment uh, in order to spend other money on those additional peoples, correct? No. Not that I know of. You budgeted, just, you budgeted a lump sum for them. You gave them 10,000 for employees or personnel, and they didn't spend it all because they couldn't hire the people. They didn't find qualified candidates. But the, let's say they hired, spent 15, uh, they hired 15 people instead of 10. If they kept within their budgeted amount, their allocated amount, the amount you appropriated for personnel, they would be fine. If they exceeded it, then they would have to do a, a budget amendment. If your line item matter is if you had, let's say, again, I use food because food is a line item for some budgets. You could strike it entirely and say, we don't want taxpayer dollars being used for food and it would be struck as an item entirely mm -hmm. and if they were to take personnel dollars and put it towards food that would be discovered maybe later during an audit that could be problematic for the official that budgeted and that spent money that that way well the reason i ask is you know they're talking a lot about uh defunding defunding sheriff's department police departments but obviously police departments as far as i know they're all appointed sheriff's departments could be either appointed or elected uh so an elected personnel let's say i said sheriff i want you to cut i'm just pretending here okay i want you to cut uh, a million dollars from um your travel uh, expenses, uh, it, and it's a budget item or training, let's say training. Uh, I want to, um, uh, you to take a million out of that. We're gonna spend that money to do something else. Uh, could we do that? I mean, we could do that, but uh, let's say he decides to spend two million on training instead of one million, he would have to come back to, for a budget adjustment, right? yes so we could go into a line and say we're gonna take this out and spend it somewhere else and basically that's some with that's where our control is correct you would let's say let's say he had a helicopter you would defund the helicopter you would defund ammunition you would defund the boat the marine safety program. You would defund search and rescue. Search and rescue is not a good one. That's statutorily required. But yes, I mean there are manners, uh, uh, ways certainly to do it. You know, I've, I've been reading up what this whole defunding thing means, and that's essentially it. I mean, you are reducing the scope of work that the sheriff's office has undertaken okay all right paul you had something yeah i i just i just want to add that that we'd have to budget by program or by line item detail or both and you can do that done it in other capacities before um you know not does not necessarily on behalf or because of an elected official or anything like that but but yes we absolutely have that power and it's it's just part of the discipline and detail 
that I think not just that department, but all departments. I mean, um, that that's that's where our that's where our power is. That's oh, where our responsibility is. I well, I know that in other departments, non-elected, we can do whatever that we want to do. I'm just checking on an elected person, which is since the sheriff's budget is the largest budget in our in the county. Uh, I just was, you know, and we're having this discussion, I'm not, about defunding the police department, sheriff department, how do they do it? Uh, and now our laws in Oregon could be very different from another state, I would assume. So other states might be able to, I mean, you could unfund the sheriff totally and say it's, uh, it's jail, search and rescue, uh, and your your mic your mic's off. Yeah, there are certain statutory duties that the sheriff has to has to perform. He detains, so he has to have a jail, whether he owns it or not, or whether the county owns it or not. It could be a private jail. He serves civil process, eviction notices, foreclosures, lawsuits, subpoenas, things along those lines. He has to have an office in the courthouse, which he does. He is in charge of the security of the courthouse, and he is to respond to the needs of the courthouse as well. So those are general um, duties of the sheriff set forth in Oregon statute. Your police, your city police system is, is, is different than what the sheriff is required to perform. Yeah. All right. I just had one of our budget committee ask a little bit about that, that discussion they're having. You would have, um, you know, issues with unions, most likely, if you were to do some significant uh, tweaking of things because of training and or uniforms and munitions. Yeah. You would have um, some other, maybe some statutory um, struggles. I know that there's been pushes to have the discipline records made available and complaints made available. Currently, all that's semi-protected by Oregon public records law and other privacy laws in Oregon. So each state is different, but some of the things that their folks are talking about would require bargaining and would require changes in state statute. Yeah, but some of them are just eliminating the police department and or the sheriff's department and rehiring them in a different capacity. <laughs> I mean, I'm again, I'm just just talking. Crazy times. What I yeah. what I would what I would say, Jim, is that what what's just to borrow Stephen's earlier phrase is that um, you know just call it just coin the phrase of lump sum budgeting. It, basically, what we're doing is say here's your lump sum, you know, and he can do anything he wants with it, or a department, you know, what it doesn't have to be an elected official. The point is that that's where the detail comes in to the advantage of the Board of County Commissioners. So in that, all departments, in all ways, in all departments. I'm not gonna pick on any one department. Yeah. So Gary did look at line item budget when he asked him to make the cuts, correct, Gary? I did, and uh, I wanna clarify, uh, Commissioner Savas is right. Every department has this, not just elected officials. Every uh, department director, when the, when the commissioners approve their budget, they can spend it any way they want as long as they stay within their fund balance. If they don't, that's when they go for a supplemental budget. I, I'm going to be changing that, by the way, uh, but I need, to, I need to give directors a heads up first. So um, more to come on that, commissioners. All right, Greg, now you know. <laughs> don't tell anyone. All right, so commissioners, we have Greg Geist here, Director of Water Environment Services. I asked him to come to give you a quick update on an item on your business meeting agenda for this Thursday a discussion item on the approval of the Regional Wastewater System Cooperative Intergovernmental Agreement. You have been briefed on this, but it's been several months. So I want to make sure you are uh, up to speed on what's going to happen this Thursday. So Greg, can you just give a real high level update of what the board will be discussing this Thursday? You're on mute, Greg. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, for the record, my name is Greg Geist. I'm the Director of Water Environment Services. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair and members of the Commission. Um, this is the, uh, actually a happy, happy news. Um, 
gosh, I don't even know. Uh, Chris Story, I think he's going to join us here in a second. Um, uh, took the lead on this project, so I want to make sure that he gets credit. Um, I think it's been almost 18 months since we engaged the Oregon Consensus Group, uh, which is supported out of the uh, PSU through the governor's office. Um, originally, the, the, the cities that we serve, a number of the cities, wanted to have a conversation about governance um, and having a voice um, related to WES. And so we went through a, a rather lengthy uh, process uh, led by uh, Oregon Consensus, a guy, Turner O'Dell, and arrived at an agreement. And what that agreement does is kind of puts the governance conversation to bed um, and brings two additional city members to our the West Advisory Committee. So now we have um, all six cities that, that are on the IGA uh, have an, an appointed, um, elected representative on the West Advisory Committee. So that is a couple changes there. Um, they would not go through the county's typical um, process for being appointed to a, an ADC. Uh, because they are elected and um, we felt that it was appropriate for them for those elected bodies to appoint someone to serve in that capacity so that's going to be a little bit different than the other members of that advisory committee uh, but because they're elected officials we thought that that was appropriate uh, the other uh, i think important and uh, impactful change that we made um, relative to that iga and the bylaws of that committee are that we ensured that we have a two-way conversation. So in addition to Wes uh, presenting to that group our budget and our capital improvement plans and our policies and all of the things that, that we take to them, that we made sure that there's an opportunity for the cities uh, to come and talk about the work that they do in their own collection systems, uh, because it does what they do or, or in some cases don't do in their collection system has a material impact on our treatment works and potentially the, all of the ratepayers that we serve. So um, those were the two important things that we achieved. Uh, the last city signed on to the IGA on June 2nd, and we are ready to uh, conclude that process. Hey, Chris, are you at Chateau Lake Louise? <laughs> it, it was about five miles from there. It is in Banff, yes. Oh, I recognize it. Yeah. Uh, one thing I'll add that you might be happy about is that the process of the elected officials all being part of the West Advisory Committee removes the necessity of having that separate elected officials forum that the board was hosting for quite a while. They are going to be all one integrated conversation now. And I wanted to thank Chair Bernard and, and Commissioner Savas for helping um, or participating and helping lead that conversation to a successful conclusion. Paul. Oh, yeah, I, I just want to just, I just want to just add that, that um, conversations recently with um, folks that are interested, highly interested in our surface water slash flooding, our MS4 permit um, have, um, I've been speaking to recently about interpretations of the MS4 permit, what we're to do about stormwater, elements of growth and so on, and some people being critical of what we're, what, what, they, what they think we're doing or not doing, more, more especially what they, what they think we're not doing. Um, I was hoping that this forum would be an opportunity to um, make gains on I&I &I, um, and um, get some more cooperation there. And I, I do know that there's a couple members that are on the committee um, that are not associated with the city that are also interested in, in pursuing that. So I, I don't know how you all broach that going forward, but I'll just tell you that is a growing concern and a growing interest. And um, uh, I think there's some other organizations we can partner with that are not in our, in our area, uh, but are, are um, um, contiguous with our area that would like to be part of that discussion because they are co-signees on the same MS4 permit. So that's my only disappointment with this is that we didn't get much much gains on something I think would offer great economies of scale, let alone um, some of the uh, opportunities for um, helping the infrastructure out um, for um, what is now um, 
the property of the cities, which I don't say we don't, that we take, that, that changes, the ownership doesn't change. But I, I think that our, you know, the, the pipes and so forth that West Lynn and Gladstone and Oregon City are grappling with, um, I think there's opportunities there that we could, that may, maybe that, you know, I'm not saying that's, um, that precludes in the future, this precludes that, it doesn't, but I was just hoping that we'd have more opportunities for that. But it's, it's a, you know, I'll, I'll be supporting it. Um, it's a, it's a step in the right direction. And if I just, my, um, yeah, I think you're right. I, I think the, it, it provides a framework for that conversation or a, a forum for that conversation, uh, whether it's inflow and infiltration and how we can work together and support each other or our surface water management programs. Um, having everyone at the table when we are talking and we do talk regularly about the projects that we work on. Uh, we're going through a rules revision right now. We're looking to put, frankly, folks like Oregon City, they have some good practices that we're uh, stealing um, and, and including in our draft rules and regulations. And, and there'll be a public process uh, later in the summer and the fall um, to get input on all that. In addition to all the work at the, at, at the advisory committee where the cities are at the table. This, this isn't the exact best time, but we don't often have uh, both uh, yourself and, and Chris um, um, in front of us. So I just going to ask a question. If, if someone uh, builds a, 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 does a development and they have uh, 500 feet of road frontage uh, that's currently unimproved and they do a development, you know, they are required to bring the road up the standards and a number of things up the standards. Are we requiring them to West if they're in the West, if they're in either CCSD one or tri cities or within our jurisdiction, uh, are, are we requiring them to um, provide adequate drainage facilities? Well, so the cities, uh, have, like you said, they're co permittees and they have their own stormwater management plans and their own rules and regulations in place. Um, in the unincorporated Clackamas County and in Happy Valley. Yes. The answer is yes. Um, I will say, and we've had an experience recently where um, the, the different jurisdictions, say for erosion and sediment control, um, our requirements kick in at a certain square footage, say, of disturbance. I think it's 5,000 square feet, a, a typical uh, lot, whereas other jurisdictions may have those requirements kick in at a lower threshold or in some cases at a higher threshold. So um, there are opportunities. There are inconsistencies out there. Um, Okay, I just want to bring everyone's attention, um, not for today per se, but just at least plant the seed that there is um, uh, different interpretations and I think there's uh, misunderstandings as far as, you know, some people think that they're holding the line and meeting the permit and by the way, you are not, whoever you are, but I, I think there's some misunderstanding of what those are and I think some people think that, that uh, everyone's doing it the same way except for jurisdiction A or jurisdiction B. Um, I'm just hoping that all the water, all the signees on the permit and the MS4 permit can get around the room and discuss that and have some uniform understanding of what or policies and practices that we all are on the same page because it apparently we're not. That is true. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Humberston. Never mind. All right. Well, thank uh, you. Know, I, I I thought this was a waste of time. Actually, I would have told you that, but uh, it really turned out pretty well. I was uh, surprised. I thank you, Chris, uh, for your hard work, and Paul. Uh, it turned out to be much uh, less an issue than I anticipated. So, thank you all very much. Look forward to signing the agreement, Mr. Schrader. Well, I also think that you should thank Shelly Perini because uh, with Greg and, and his team, she was sure. really the one that brought the appreciative inquiry model to, uh, to this group, which I think worked remarkably well. Thank you, Shelly. <laughs> yes, Shelly has a hand in virtually everything that we're successful at. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anybody else? Thank I you, guys. Oh, Chris, you just one just to make sure that you saw this is a presentation that we're going to be doing a brief discussion item for you rather than being on the consent agenda. So we'll sort of reiterate some of these points for you. And uh, frankly, uh, we intend to publicly thank all of you and the other participants again.
All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, finally, uh, commissioners is uh, commissioner communications. That's your last item. Would like to start. I All have right. nothing. I have nothing this week other than we've have um, continued to work to deliver food to our senior centers, and I thank all the staff that have been participating in making that happen. Sonia, you're good. Yeah, I don't have anything to add. We did a lot of communicating today, so I appreciate it. Yeah, Martha. Yeah, a couple of things, and I'm going to apologize for the noise in the background. I have somebody on my roof, and um, it's been a real interesting experience to go to a meeting on Zoom. I'm learning to focus no matter what happens. Um, maybe that's because I raised five kids. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, I had a conversation with Bridget Daisy and the chair of the Workforce Board. They would like to apply for the Payroll Protection Act. They would like our risk people to take a look at it. Um, I don't know if Tracy's on or not. She's got some of the details as well. Um, what that would entail is they would be applying for uh, payroll protection as a nonprofit. I, uh, and they think, they think they have an excellent chance of also having, um, having that loan forgiven. The issue is we need to have our risk folks look at it because there is a we owe a requirement that if things go cattywampus um, with funding of one way or another that the, the county is held accountable. Um, my, I, my notion is I believe that only has to do with federal dollars that are being funneled through the workforce board. So if my question is, um, is that something that we can give them a thumbs up to do? Uh, and can we have our risk people advise us on that? Um, the chair of the workforce board is a banker. He is working now getting out some of these loans to other businesses. He is not going to wear his banker hat as they move through to do this. And Tracy, I think they were short about $70,000. Isn't that so? That's right. You want to add anything because you've been on the conversations with me. Yes. So thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioners Tracy Moreland from uh, BCC Admin. So uh, the Workforce Partnership is considering this in part because as a nonprofit, they're funded by grants and some of their grants are sunsetting, not recurring. They do have other funding, but because of COVID-19, they're anticipating a greater demand for their work for workforce services and programs. So this PP loan would help bridge any financial gaps that happen there. And the loan amount is, is for $133,000. And that would be used only for payroll. That's what the PPP program is all about. And Commissioner Schrader mentioned the debt forgiveness, which happens based on a certain number of criteria, mainly being that you use the money just for your payroll and that, you pay, that you're using it during a certain time frame, which CWP believes that they can do. So they just really want our risk folks to help ascertain if there's if this would be a good fit, a workable idea for them being a nonprofit and are there any drawbacks for them or any drawbacks for the county? I don't get, let me make sure. I don't get why our risk people, what our risk people would analyze. I know a number of people who have applied for this money and didn't get it. Uh, yeah, and so the risk is they either forgive it or they don't. Mm -hmm. How are they gonna determine that? Well, my, my issue is that we don't, if they go ahead and move with this, we need to have a decision because quite frankly, we don't want to be culpable for the money. That's why they want our risk people to take a look at it. They, I think they they want our, it's our finance staff. So yes, our finance staff absolutely can look at this and advise. Okay, let's do that. Thank All you. Right. All right, then Paul. All right, I have one thing, uh, and I think uh, Mac or still on, yes. So um, I've been asked to sign a mutual aid agreement between Multnomah and Clackamas County, uh, our sheriff's department, which would indemnify the sheriff's department uh, in participation with uh, Multnomah County. Is it sheriff or uh, police or uh, 
Portland Police or is it just Sheriff? It's the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office. It's yeah. Sheriff Mike Reese. Yes, uh, this would identify Clackamas County Sheriff uh, should an incident occur. And uh, Stephen agrees it's a, it's a good idea. It's something we've wanted for a while. Uh, and we have an agreement and uh, Sheriff Kapori will sign and I'll, I can sign. So I'm just letting you know, correct? <laughs> right, I just got an email from Sheriff Roberts saying that he was gonna be in touch with Sheriff Reese. So commissioners, what happened? It's a request from Sheriff, uh, Multnomah County Sheriff Mike Reese to Sheriff Roberts that um, requesting for an intergovernmental or a mutual aid agreement to allow Clackamas Sheriff's deputies to aid Multnomah County Sheriff's deputies related to probably some of the, the protests and probably to some other law enforcement activities that have been strained because Multnomah has been devoting their full force to protecting the Justice Center in uh, downtown Portland. But what it does is under ORS chapter 402, it puts the responsibility on the requesting agency for the responding agency's acts. So it's basically a burden and in, in, uh, risk shifting um, statutory scheme. And so with the Sheriff of Multnomah requesting the assistance of Clackamas County, they have agreed to defend and hold harmless and indemnify those employees from Clackamas who do aid Multnomah County. We're not sure what the uh, actual task would be or the assignment, but that has been the request and it's, um, and, and I certainly from a legal perspective and a risk perspective support it. Mr. Savas. So my question is, if this is not related to COVID and it doesn't sound like it is, um, then why would it not come before us um, for review and discussion uh, and or, and why would the, not picking on anyone, but wh why, why would we just assume that we would just sign it? Um, I, I would, we haven't talked about money or cost and that's a factor. And uh, you know, it's not as though we have um, you know, a lot of resources and I've heard the sheriff um, be very mindful of the financial limitations that we all have and he has. Um, so um, if, it seems a little bit odd though. I mean, I, I know that, um, am I to understand that they're helping Portland, they're backfilling Portland's extra needs because of the protests. So therefore we're gonna, we're gonna backfill Multnomah County. Um, that seems like a, you know, it seems more like if it's gonna be a, a, a financial impact, even if we're indemnified, that that's, that someone ought to be compensating. Is there, a, is there an agreement, for example, for Portland to compensate the Multnomah County Sheriff's Department? And if so, it, we, we in kind should also be compensated. So I just, I just want to know if anyone's thought that through and have we, do I have a copy of, of that agreement? There is no formalized agreement. It's a request. I can certainly circulate it to the board. It came from Sheriff Reese to uh, Sheriff Roberts. And it's basically just a letter request. And it's frankly, it's what the statute contemplates as well as it could even be a verbal agreement between the two entities. It does need to go to the county administrator and or the governing body. It's not the sheriff's call on that. But I would, I would say that this isn't, I, I can't say that it's not COVID related. Quite frankly, I think this whole thing is under the cloud of COVID right now. I think that a lot of the public uh, unrest and I think a lot of the, the um, protests and disruptions have an air of COVID to them myself. So we could certainly circulate it um, to you. It's a simple, very, it's like a one paragraph request. We could certainly set, submit that to you. I am not aware of the agreement between Multnomah County and the city of Portland with, with backfilling, um, but I do know that they have been devoting law enforcement resources to the downtown core area and not to other areas. And so that's been part of the, uh, the, the train. 
I, I think that we already have a mutual aid agreement. This one, the sheriff insisted that he wouldn't go there unless he was indemnified. And the, well, I, yeah, it just, it just seems like to indemnify that you would need a signatures on it, right? I mean, you just don't say, by the way, um, verbally, I'm gonna indemnify you and, and, and suddenly that's gonna protect us in court. If something goes wrong, I mean, there's gotta be, there's gotta be a paper signature. There is, agreement. there's a letter and they want me to sign it. Well, th then that's, then show me, I, I guess I'm, like, I'm getting back to, it's, it's that, and I, I'd like to see, and it's also the, you know, for example, if these protests go on for three months, does that mean that that's going to be at the detriment of patrolling Clackamas County? I, 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 I need, I kind of am concerned about the detriment to our citizens and our inability of funds to do it. And what happens if it happens here? Oh, at a pro, at a prolonged at a prolonged state. Yeah. Then I then I, I guess that's an expense that the county should bear. Ken, you got to turn your mic on. The salient questions are identification. There ought, ought to be a document that makes it clear that we are indemnified if we send our deputies there. The mutual agreement aspect of it, as Commissioner Bernard is pointing out, is very simple. Um, if they come here to help us, we indemnify them. If we go there to help them, they indemnify us. And the final question is, who pays for what? So if we send our people to Clackamas County, or excuse me, to Multnomah County to help out, or to the city of Portland to help out, are they going to pay the costs of our people? Yes or no? I don't think so, but I don't know that. How does that no. work? Yeah, yeah, and, and, and if we if we send a vehicle there and the vehicle is destroyed or set on fire, who pays for the vehicle? We do. There we go. I, I, I don't think that's right. So we'll tell the sheriff, no, don't call on us. Is that what you're suggesting? No, that, that's that's kind of snarky, Jim. Well, uh, what, what, I, what I'm saying is that it, we need to be covered, not not just indemnified. I'm not saying no, I'm saying it needs, it, it needs to be more thoughtful. So Stephen, can we do that? Can we, if we send people in, if something to our vehicle or people happen, can we have an agreement where they, because it's in their jurisdiction, they'll pay for it? You could certainly have an agreement along those lines. That's not what's being requested, proposed, or asked for, but you certainly could. This is a request. I just circulated it to you. It is a request for aid from the sheriff's office to Multnomah County for 90 days is what it is, up to 90 days. And this is all at the discretion of Sheriff Roberts as well. If he doesn't have staff to deploy there and aid them, then it's going to be a meaningless um, request and, and uh, response. But the point is, is that no, the risk is the workers comp is, is ours. The, if there's damage to a uh, county vehicle there, that would be on us. There's nothing reduced to writing saying if anything happens to county property that we get paid for it. There's no salary reimbursement component of this either. So what do you want to do? Well, can I just chime in here? I think that it sounds to me, Jim, that they just wanted this piece as soon as possible because this is unfolding right now. Yes. So what I would suggest is that we as a board agree for Jim to sign it. And then these other questions that are very good, I think we should get information and get briefed on how do these things work and what is the public expense. And I mean, there's a lot of things that we need to know as the elected officials for Clackamas County, how, what's happening with our public safety, and this is just another question. But I wouldn't want to stop this, because at a minimum, indemnifying Clackamas County employees and officers that are there on the scene is a good thing. So, so I would suggest that, make a motion that we um, allow Jim to sign it and um, have have, um, and Gary, I don't know who that would be. I guess we direct our administrator to get us more information on these other pertinent questions. 
So is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Further discussion? You know, this is very common between fire districts, police departments. Uh, and I know that we have a water rescue uh, uh, that the sheriff does that is uh, a mutual aid agreement. Martha. Yeah, Sonia, could you repeat that motion? I was distracted, I apologize. Could you repeat it? Well, my motion was just that we authorize Jim to sign that letter. And then we also instruct Gary Schmidt to answer Paul's pertinent questions to get us more information. Any further yeah, I think discussion? What, Go ahead. Yeah, I think I think what brings this discussion uh, out like this is because the sheriff initially canceled his that relationship, I guess, with Portland, which brought it to 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 our consciousness, if you will. And, and now all of a sudden, um, he you know we're we're being asked to help, and <clears throat> something that I guess before we didn't really think too much about, and it was a normal practice between jurisdictions, becomes questionable in our minds. Um, but I, it, it, the emergency of the moment is, an, is, is a legitimate emergency, and obviously um, we should help. But there's, there should be some clear understandings that, uh, you know, if we go there, costs are covered, indemnification's there, those kinds of things, and vice versa. And I don't, I'm not sure why that is so complicated. Well, if, if this results in a million dollars or two million dollars in overtime, um, and if the sheriff can absorb that, that's fine. But uh, I, I don't want this to be that if we approve it, then we then we suddenly we approve the the overtime expense, and that's outside the budget. Well, this is out of his budget. Yeah, and Paul, this doesn't have anything to do with the costs. This all this has to do with is making sure that we don't cover the cost of any lawsuit that would stem from us being helping in the Portland area. That's all this agreement does. All right, so let's poll. Okay, Commissioner Humberston. Aye. Commissioner Fisher. Aye. Commissioner Schrader. Aye. Commissioner Savas. Not at this time. Chair Bernard. Aye. Motion carries. Anyway, all right, anything else, Gary, on the issues list? Yeah, I forgot, uh, Commissioner Humberston asked to take off the Construction Careers Pathways Project update uh, to hold for now. So that is, I added it to your list, but it actually is removed at his request. So FYI, other than that, you are done with your list. You're done for the day. All right, with that, we're adjourned. Thank you.